come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. For your anger is but for a moment. Weeping may endure for a night. I cried out to you, O Lord. And to the Lord I made supplication. Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Lord, may your house of worship be filled with worshipful hearts and worshipful spirits. Lord, may this place be a holy place in the mind and heart of each one of us today as we come to hear your word and to receive your gifts, your love and your wisdom, which are symbolized in the Holy Supper. Lord, help us to come here prepared to worship you and to receive. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Make your face shine upon your servant. be to the Lord God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You'll turn to number 425 in your liturgies. You'll find a recitation for today, which is taken from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30. For this commandment, which I command you today, it is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near to you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. Please be seated. In just a moment, I'm going to read a story where the Lord talks about a man sowing seeds. But first I have an illustration. I have here a rock and two seeds, which are small and hard to see. 
And I'm wondering if someone can maybe tell me, what's going to happen if I plant these seeds very carefully on this rock? What's going to happen? Nothing will happen. What if I plant them very carefully? No? No? What if I water the seeds and hold the rock in the sun? What's going to happen then? Anything? Anything? No. no? Nothing? So, do you think that means that what I need to do is get new seeds? No? no? It's not the seeds' problem that they're not growing on the rock? No. What's my problem? Yeah. I don't have any soil. That's right. You can't grow seeds on a rock. So here's a story from the Lord's Word where the Lord talks about a man sowing seeds and about places where seeds can't grow. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places, where they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the Lord talks about somebody going out and sowing seeds. And he says some of those seeds, they fell on the side of the road, and they didn't even get a chance to grow. The birds came and just ate them, and that was that. Some of the seeds fell on rocky ground, but there was a little bit of dirt, but not a lot. And so they started to grow, but then when the sun got hot, they weren't planted deeply enough, and so they were scorched, and they died. And other seeds were planted in a weedy place where there were thorn plants that grew up and choked out the seeds so that they didn't, because they didn't have any sun. And some of the seeds fell on good ground where they were able to grow up like they're meant to. It's a pretty good illustration of where seeds can grow and can't grow. But we know that the Lord's not just trying to tell us how to plant seeds. He's trying to tell us something a little deeper. And the Lord's disciples listening to the story also knew that it was supposed to mean something deeper, but they didn't understand it. So they asked him, Lord, what do you mean by telling us this? And so the Lord explained the parable to them. And he said, therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who sowed seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who receives the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who received the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So the Lord says that those seeds 
are like the truths of his word. They're the good, true things that he's trying to plant in our minds and in our hearts so that they grow up into all of the good things that he wishes for us to have. And the seeds are good, but if we're trying to plant them somewhere that they're just not going to grow, it doesn't matter how hard we try, seeds just can't grow on a rock. And all of those different places where the seeds fell in the story, those represent different attitudes or different states of mind and heart in us. They're different ways we can respond when the Lord teaches us his word. The seeds that fell by the side of the road are like teachings that just go in one ear and out the other. We don't even understand them. Don't even have a chance to start appreciating them teachings, the, the seeds that fell on the stony ground, that's like when the word falls on a kind of a stony heart. We, we hear it, we say, yeah, that's true. But there's a part of us that's not willing to let it all the way in. We don't let it down deep. We don't take it into our heart and really say, I'm going to live this. And so, when it starts to get hard to do what the Lord teaches, like when we start to say, it's really hard to go to this other person and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Or it's really hard to resist this feeling that if I just told a lie, I could get myself out of trouble. If those seeds aren't planted down deep, when it starts to get hard, it's too easy to say, you know, it just doesn't matter that much. It's not that important to me. And so those truths from the Lord, they started to grow up, but then they stopped growing. They die. And the weeds that some of the seeds fell in, those represent other voices in our heads. Voices that say things like, hey, it's fun to play video games. You know what really makes me feel good? What really makes me feel happy is chocolate ice cream. All the things from the world around us. And those voices can be pretty loud, just like weeds can grow really fast. And if we're giving too much time to all those other voices, they grow up so big and fast that there's no space to listen to the Lord's word. There's no space in us where we can stop and think, hey, what the Lord teaches is really important. But the good ground. So when we hear the Lord's teachings and we understand them and we try to take good care of them. When we say what the Lord teaches is that we should be useful and try to love our neighbor and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take care of these seeds so that they grow up like they're meant to. And we know that one of the miracles of a seed is that that one tiny seed becomes a plant or a tree that has thousands of its own seeds. And each of those seeds can become a new plant. And so that one little thing can turn into so much more than what you started with. And just the same way, the one little truth that the Lord wants to plant in us is going to grow up into so many blessings and so many ideas about how we can serve our neighbor. But we have to choose to let those seeds be planted in good ground. So we have to choose to make ourselves a good field, not a stony place, not a thorny place, not the side of the road. So that when the Lord teaches us, we can take it in and let the truth grow. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, help us to learn your truth faithfully and willingly. Help us, Lord, to seek to put the truth into practice, into use, using both our mind to understand it and our heart 
to live and believe it so that we can truly be your servants. Amen. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen.
Our next lesson from the Word is taken from the Gospel of Luke, a parable from chapter 18. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then they also brought infants to him that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called to them and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And our next lesson is taken from the book True Christian Religion under the heading, The People Who Worthily Approach the Holy Supper Are Those Who Have Faith in the Lord and charity towards the neighbor, so those who have been regenerated. These facts can be illustrated by examples which agree and also correspond, as, for instance, the following. None are admitted to the table of an emperor or king, but those who hold high office and rank. And these, before coming, dress themselves in proper clothes and wear their decorations, so that when they appear, they will be received and approved. Should one then not do the same on approaching the Lord's table, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and all are invited and called to his table. But only those who are spiritually worthy and in dignified dress are, after rising from the table, admitted to the palaces of heaven and the joys of heaven, being honored like princes, because they are the sons of the greatest king, and afterwards sit at table daily with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By these names are meant the Lord as regards the heavenly divine, the spiritual divine, and the natural divine. The same facts can also be compared with a wedding on earth, to which only close relatives, kinsfolk, and friends of the bridegroom and bride are invited. If anyone else comes, he's allowed in, but leaves because there's no place for him at the table. It's much the same with those who are summoned to the wedding of the Lord as bridegroom, with the church as bride. Among these are the kinsfolk, relatives, and friends who belong to the family by being regenerated by the Lord. Moreover, is anyone in the world allowed to become someone's friend unless, in sincerity of heart, he trusts him and does his will. It is this person and no others that one counts among one's friends and to whom one entrusts one's property. Amen. Here end the readings from the Word. Blessed are those who hear the Word of God and keep it.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be for good pleasure before you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Please be seated. When the word talks about approaching the Lord worthily, it's easy for us to get nervous. This idea of worthiness can feel like it doesn't quite fit with the overall turn, tone of the Lord's message. His word is meant to be an invitation to us, isn't it? But then right there in the reading from True Christian Religion, we heard the people who worthily approach the Holy Supper are those who have faith in the Lord and charity towards the neighbor, so those who have been regenerated. Another heading from the same chapter says, The Lord is present and opens heaven to those who worthily approach the Holy Supper. He is also present to those who approach it unworthily, but he does not open heaven to them. It's easy to hear these sorts of statements and maybe on one level say, Okay, that's fair, that makes sense. And at the same time, on another level, be saying, so am I worthy? Can I presume to call myself worthy? And these statements can be especially challenging because they're given in context of teachings about the Lord's Holy Supper. Given that we tend to think of the Holy Supper as an occasion for deep and maybe painful personal reflection. It seems almost cruel to be asked to look hard at yourself, maybe at the parts of yourself that you wanted to keep hidden away, and then right after that to be asked to judge whether or not we're worthy. And then there's this image from the Lord's word of this tax collector in the temple praying to God, beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Is that what we're supposed to be? Is the whole point that we're supposed to come to the conclusion that we are unworthy? And does this mean that we should feel ashamed? That we should put the burden of our sins on our shoulders and wear it until we fall down? In a rational light, it's so clear that that's not what God would ever ask of us. But it can feel like it sometimes. Of course, the whole point of the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector is that the tax collector is the one who was worthy. The Lord's clearly telling us this parable to show us what worthiness really means in his eyes. He's explicitly addressing certain people who believe that they are worthy. He spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. He wants us to see that this Pharisee who believes that he is without sin is sinning even as he congratulates himself for his righteousness because he shows contempt for the tax collector. But the message of the parable isn't that the Pharisee was the real sinner and the tax collector wasn't. The tax collector says that he is a sinner and we're supposed to take him at his word. The story doesn't say what he'd done wrong, but we know from the Gospels that tax collectors were infamous for using their power to extort money from the powerless, so much so that they were symbols of corruption point is that the tax collector was a sinner, and so was the Pharisee. Both men were sinners. Both men needed the Lord's help, but one of them asked for it. One of them thought that he stood on high, and so in his prayer, he didn't ask the Lord for anything. And the other one saw that he was low, and so he made himself low and asked the Lord to lift him up. 
And the Lord says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. That same statement appears in another parable from the Gospel of Luke, one that ties in even more directly with the reading from true Christian religion and the Holy Supper. We read, So he told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place lest one more honorable than you be invited by him, and he who invited you come and say to you, give place to this man, and you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The Lord says to us, when you come to my table, come with the right attitude. Prepare yourself so that when you come, you come with the right spirit. Don't come to the wedding feast like you're the main event. You're just a guest. Come with humility. The reading from True Christian Religion talked about preparing yourself for a dinner with the king or some other important person. The idea of going to a dinner with the king might seem a little out of date or irrelevant, but there are state dinners and formal events in every capital city around the world, and for the most part, the people invited to them are people who hold a certain rank or position. And if one of us were invited to an event like that, we wouldn't wear street clothes. We know that if we did, it would be disrespectful. The reading said that all are invited and called to the Lord's table. No one is stamped with the word unworthy and turned away at the door. And still, it is a blessing and an honor to receive that invitation. It's a blessing to be able to approach the Lord's altar and take his holy supper. It's a blessing to be able to be conjoined with him by living as he teaches. If we approach him wearing disrespect as our clothing, failing to show him the humility that is his due as Lord, then it's clear that we haven't recognized the invitation for what it is. And so we haven't really accepted it, not in spirit anyway. We don't really want to be there participating in what the Lord means for that dinner to be. But approaching worthily isn't just about this basic kind of humility. The second part of the reading compared going to the Lord's table with going to the wedding of the Lord as bridegroom with the church as bride. Anyone can come to a wedding in the sense that even today there aren't usually people standing at the doors turning away the uninvited. But the people who belong at a wedding are the friends and relatives of the bridegroom and the bride. The Lord gave us this second illustration as a way of saying to us that he wants us to approach him not merely as servants who show him due respect. He wants us to come to him as friends coming to his wedding. He says, no longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Still, the reading from True Christian Religion says, Is anyone in the world allowed to become someone's friend unless in sincerity of heart he trusts him and does his will? And the Lord said, 
you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. That may seem one-sided, but really, when we listen to the Lord, then for the first time, our relationship with him starts to become mutual because he's always been working to make us happy. If we're going to accept the Lord's invitation as his friend, then we need to work to be worthy of that name. We need to try to be a true friend, one who can be counted on to love and to receive love. Approaching the Lord worthily is about understanding who we approach and understanding what we are as we do the approaching. It's about understanding his holiness and wishing not to bring into his presence anything that doesn't belong. It's about wanting to be a guest who belongs at his table, a servant who shows respect, a friend who is trusted and is worthy of that trust. To become these things, we do need to look hard at ourselves and see what we need to leave behind. We need to do this even if it's painful. We need to know what we are and what we're not. We're not righteous simply because we look good on the outside. And that tax collector who bent down and asked God for mercy because he saw his sin was doing the right thing. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. We may feel and see that we've sunk low, but the Lord's desire is to lift us up, to say, friend, go up higher. His desire is to call us friends. It's no accident that the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector is followed immediately by the story of little children being brought to the Lord. It's no accident that the Lord said, whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And immediately after that said, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Those little children who are pictures of innocence, pictures of humility that looks down on no one, go to the Lord, and he lifts them up in his arms. Amen. Please rise. Now to the one only God, Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank mm-hmm. you.